Bring your friends and your folks along Down to the river and sing this song My name is Kathy Fredrickson. I am the senior warden here at St. Paul's. On behalf of our entire congregation, I'd like to welcome you to this special program featuring the Church of the Holy Apostles Episcopal Church in Oneida, Wisconsin. From the historical perspective, for centuries prior to the American Revolution, the Oneida Nation controlled millions of acres of dense forests, beautiful lakes, and rivers in what is now New York State. Because of westward colonization, the original people were forced to yield land and seek a new life in the central United States. The Oneida Nation began negotiations with the Menominee and Ho-Chunk Nation for land in Wisconsin in 1821. In 1822, the territory the Oneida Nation purchased, a large section of land and territory that would become the state of Wisconsin. Led by Eliezer Williams, an Episcopal minister reputed to have been the long lost dolphin of France and Chief Daniel Bread, the first movement to, of, the Oneidas, of the Oneidas to Wisconsin settled in what is now <clears throat> the Grand Chute or Kokana area. Dubbed the first Christian party, this group of 448 people were tribal members who had embraced Christianity. Official reservation borders were established in 1838. Joining us tonight to share the story of Oneida's children, ho children's homecoming is the Reverend Roger Patience current rector of the Church of the Holy Apostles Episcopal Church in Oneida. He's joined by church member and tribal council member Kirby Metoxen, who was instrumental in this homecoming. Please welcome the Oneida people. Good evening, my name is Kirby Metoxen. I'm from the Oneida Nation. I serve as an elected official for the Oneida Nation as a council member. And we were asked to come up and talk about the um, disinternment of the um, children from Carlisle. This is Father Patience. And I'm Roger Patience. Whoa, that's loud. I'm Roger Patience. I'm the vicar of Church of the Holy Apostles and they'll get it turned down a little bit in a second. That's probably better. Uh, I've been at Church of the Holy Apostles for about three years now, and as Kirby's spiritual advisor, uh, was invited to accompany him uh, and two other families uh, who made the trip to Carlisle Indian School, uh, where some Oneida children who had been students there more than 100 years ago had died at the Indian School and their bodies were to be disinterred and returned uh, for reburial in Oneida. Um, we thought we might open with a song and a prayer uh, to give you a little bit of uh, Oneida Episcopal specific context. Uh, and then we'll tell you some stories about uh, the church and about our recent experience in Carlisle. When F Father Patience and I were talking about a hymn, um, I, I let him pick the hymn. And in our conversations, um, I, I've learned to sing the Christian hymns in my language at a very young age. And I've been singing the hymns probably from the age of six to eight years old and went to elderly homes to learn some of the hymns. Throughout my years of learning the hymns, we're starting to lose some of the different songs for the, the seasons. We have Christmas songs, Easter songs, fall songs, spring songs. We have a song for the sick, 
And the one we picked out, it's called Wandering Boy. Wandering Boy is a, um, a hymn that was almost lost, and there's still a few tribal members that can still sing it. I'll tell you a little bit background of this hymn. It's typically sung at a funeral of a veteran, and it's called Wandering Boy. Oneida singers, <clears throat> who are a cultural group in the Oneida Nation, uh, were originally members of the Episcopal Church and the Methodist Church, who were converted in large part by the singing of Christian hymns uh, and translated those hymns into their own language and have carried that tradition of singing uh, even to the present day. And as Kirby mentioned, a song like Wandering Boy or another very much like it might be sung at the end of a funeral service at Holy Apostles as we prepare to take the body of the one who has died out into the cemetery uh, for commendation and committal. Those words are going to be important, and I'll come back to them in a few minutes. <clears throat> but one of the prayers that we pray at the commendation of someone who has died is this. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant. Acknowledge, we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive them into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. We do a lot of funerals at Church of the Holy Apostles, uh, but the funeral that we celebrated this past summer was unusual because it was a funeral for three children who had died more than 100 years before while they were far from home at the Carlisle Indian Boarding School. Uh, I asked Kirby maybe to say a word or two about how the invitation to bring them home even came about and then I thought we would share with each other the stories of what we experienced in June when we went to Pennsylvania with two other families. Okay. Um, <clears throat> my introduction to the Carlisle boarding school, like most Oneida people, our tribal members throughout the United States, 
There are 567 tribes in the United States, and we have 11 tribes here in the state of Wisconsin. And so all tribal members, families, have heard the stories of boarding schools. And in 1879, Carlisle Boarding School had children there till 1918. During that era, it was illegal for tribal families to keep their children at home with them. And so the United States government went to reservations and they gathered the children. We had over 400 children from the Oneida community that went to Carlisle Boarding School. There were other boarding schools in the United States. I think we had a couple here in Wisconsin. Nailsville, I, I heard of. There was one near Gresham. Um, but for some reason, a lot of our children went to Pennsylvania. And in downtown Oneida was a train station. And I was very fortunate to have first stories. My, my great aunt, which would have been my last great aunt, she um, died at age 97. But I was able to spend the last 10 years with, with her and Sundays I would take her for a ride. And my grandmother had passed away before I was born. And so that was my connection to my past. And she talked about the boarding school. Um, she had told me that she was the last group of people to leave Carlisle before it closed. She, she was, so that was 1918. She would have been about 16 years old. And she talked about the, the, the goal of the boarding school era was to kill the Indian and save the man. And so when they went, they weren't allowed to speak their language. They weren't allowed to practice traditional ceremonies. And they were only allowed to speak English. They were taught trades um, for washing, drying, cooking, sewing, um, agricultural farming. Um. And so I heard all the horror stories, and if you can imagine, and, and there's a million different stories. Um, so fast forwarding about five, four, four years ago, three, four years ago, I was traveling with three friends of mine out to Pennsylvania to a, an auction. And um, so these three gentlemen knew I was Oneida, but they, they didn't know anything about me as being Oneida. And so in our long ride, that's about a 16, 17 hour drive, um, there's a lot of questions asked. Um, do you speak your language? Do you have ceremonies? And I, I don't speak the language. Um, I can sing the hymns in the language, but when I sing the hymns in the language, I don't know how to interpret them. I'm only mimicking the melody I was told. And so in our conversation, we were coming to Pennsylvania, and I had mentioned to them the Carlisle Boarding School, and they, they couldn't believe this. They said they never heard this. They were all retired. One was a retired engineer, one was a retired teacher, and um, they said they had never heard of this boarding school era. And as we driving through Pennsylvania, they said, you know, we're going right through Pen Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and we should stop. You, would you like to stop and at least tour that? And I said, no, I, I, I really didn't care to you. I understand it was a military base now or something to do with the military. And one of the gentlemen was a Vietnam era veteran. And he said, I, I have a pass, I have my veterans card, and I, I will be able to get us on the military base. And, and I, I had probably said no for quite a ways. <laughs> and they insisted, and I said, you know, I'm okay. Well, if you guys want to stop, and they said, when will you ever come here? I said, all right, let's stop. <laughs> so we went into the military base, and we had to all get carded, and there was a whole process to get onto the military base security. And we asked, are there any remains from the boarding school? And uh, the, the security guard there, he says, you know, we, we have a few buildings, the, um, the, the stadium where Jim Thorpe you know, ran track, played football, that's still, um, and the bleachers in that area. They said there's a few things, but there, 
for the most part, really not much. They said, oh, there's a cemetery. Now, mind you, I grew up hearing the stories of boarding schools and the kids going away. I assumed they all came back. And so he said, there, there's one thing right across the street here is a cemetery. And I said, a cemetery? And even at that point, it didn't hit me. And um, so we, we drove in and um, we parked and we walked up to the cemetery and there's a plaque. Um, we did take pictures of that plaque and it, um, Carlisle Boarding School was referred to as, do you remember the name of it? Carlisle Indian Industrial, Industrial School. School. And that was the, the plaque. And so these headstones, and if you've ever seen a military headstone, a cemetery with all those white little headstones, this is what that cemetery was. There was 180 of them. Even then, because I've seen military cemeteries, it hadn't hit me. And um, so we read the, the remaining, and as a tribal member, none of my elders ever talked about anybody dying there. So these headstones, I assumed I was going to see a Cheyenne, a Sioux, Arapaho, Ojibwe, other tribes. And as we go in and I start reading, and it just had a name, the tribe they were from, and one date, the date they died. And as a... Um, my, my friends, um, we walked into the cemetery, and it's just like walking into a cemetery. There was no emotion really with it. It was people I don't know. And as I'm walking along, I see Jemima Kulan. Ophelia Paulus and it said Oneida. I wasn't prepared to see Oneida names. When I seen the Paulus name, my grandmother's last name is Paulus. I walked further and I seen my mother-in-law's last name, Wheelock. And I think about the third or fourth one, the name on that headstone was Melissa Matoxin. And my niece, my niece, her name is Melissa Patoxon. And I took a step and I, I froze. And I think it was just taking that breath and I just sobbed. Um, it was overwhelming. Um, the friends I was traveling with, they stopped in their tracks and they didn't understand. I think it caught them off guard. It caught me off guard <laughs> because I wasn't prepared for that um, emotion to surface. And my feelings at the time was these kids didn't ask to be here. How come nobody came to get them? And so I'm now elected as a tribal leader. And one of my I guess goals for myself was to help bring some of these children home. And so I started doing research and finding out that the Arapaho tribe was one of the tri first tribes to have um, some remains brought home and contacting them and, and hooking up with the Army Corps of Engineers. Now, it gets kind of confusing, and maybe you can explain yeah. some of that between the Army Corps mm -hmm. of Engineers, the boarding school, and the military today. Absolutely, absolutely. What, what Kirby mentioned is that <clears throat> Carlisle today is an army barracks. Uh, it was an army barracks uh, during the Civil War, and after the Civil War uh, was not needed as an army barracks because the colonial settler movement was all westward. And so the army was needed farther west than Pennsylvania. And so Carlisle was turned to a new use by being turned into the Indian Industrial Boarding School uh, by Richard Pratt, who was the army officer who founded 
Carlisle as a school for Indians. That was in about 1879. So 1879 to 1918, Carlisle functioned as an Indian boarding school. Um, thousands and thousands of children uh, were brought to that school. Most of them came home. A couple hundred of them, though, uh, died of various diseases or died for various reasons, you know, things like tuberculosis or pneumonia, uh, and were buried in the cemetery there at Carlisle. But after World War I, uh, the army needed Carlisle again. They wanted to use the property as a hospital for soldiers coming back from World War I. And so the Indian school was closed. Carlisle became once more an army base. And by World War II and the immediate aftermath of World War II, uh, Carlisle as an army base was going to be the site for the War College. Some of you might have heard of the name War College. Uh, the idea is that you might need to teach your colonels and your generals to be diplomats just as much as soldiers in the Cold War era and in the era after World War II. And so, Carlisle wanted to build a war college, and the place they wanted to build it was where the Indian children were buried in the cemetery. And so they disinterred the children in the 50s, I think, moved them to their current location, which is right by the main road that runs in front of the uh, army base. If you just drive past the base, you can see that row of, of headstones. Um, so the children had already been moved once. And then uh, for many, many years, the army had a fairly rigid policy of not doing anything about it. Um, in part because if you're the base commander of one base, you don't have the juice uh, to work up through the bureaucracy to do something about it, and then you might rotate out and somebody else comes in. So not a lot really happened until about four or five years ago. And what we understand uh, from our visit is that the Department of the Army, and especially the Army National Military Cemeteries, so you think Arlington National Cemetery, uh, that's the most, uh, most of us can picture that in our minds. The directors of the Army National Military Cemeteries started to realize that they have hundreds of Indian children in their military cemeteries. And finally, at one point, the director at that national level said, wait a minute, what are we doing with Indian children in our military cemeteries? We should look into this and maybe do something different about it. And that began a process where the Army Corps of Engineers and the Army Military Cemeteries have begun reaching out to the tribes. I wanted to add in here also about, about that time, the Arapaho tribe, um, and I believe they're from Wyoming, Tri tribes, I guess, throughout history have approached the military <clears throat> to disinter or repatriate these children back to their tribes, but it was always no. Yeah. And so it was about that time, four or five years before, the Arapaho finally approached the military and said, how can we change that no to a yes? Yeah. And that's where I think it sort of raised up to the level of somebody at the national military cemeteries who could then do something about it. And so it's a relatively recent process, as we understand it, whereby the army is reaching out, not really to tribes, but trying to reach out to families. Because the, the army way of treating the dead is that you, you engage directly with the relatives, the families of the deceased. And so, Kirby and others on tribal council or tribal government are facilitating connecting the army with the families, if you will. And so then my role with the tribe then was to work with our tribal enrollment. We have an incredible enrollment department um, within our tribe and we have an incredible cultural heritage department that do a lot of family trees for tribal members. So they work very um, collectively and what we found out that a tribal government could not repatriate or disinter these children it had to be descendants of those children so the descendants today would be because these were children it would be their fourth fifth cousins 
that would have to be. And so we had to work with our um, enrollments department. It was a, took a lot of research, and I, I got to commend our our trust enrollment and our um, cultural heritage department because we were able to locate over 250 tribal members today who were descendants of, uh, we have seven children there. So of those seven children, and um, then we had to send letters to those <laughs> family members. And nine times out of 10, even the family member, they knew about the boarding school or they had family stories of family members who went there and never came home, but didn't know how to repatriate yeah. them. Didn't know what to do about it, really. How did you and Rosa get involved uh, in this particular <clears throat> trip? So my introduction was that tour, that trip. Um, how I ended up being one of the descendants of one of the children that were there. The child that um, I brought home, her name was Ophelia Paulus, and my grandmother was a Paulus, like I said. One of the things with the Army Corps of Engineers, it could not be the tribe, it had to be a descendant. What we were able to find out through our records was Ophelia Paulus, her mom and dad, they only had the one child, and they died while she was at Carlisle. So she ended up being an orphan. And so they told the attorney for the Army Corps of Engineers who talked before all our tribal members. We sent out 250 invites to come to a meeting so we could talk to you about how to go about filling out this application because you have to request it from the Army Corps of Engineers and um, invite them. And, so we probably had about 60 tribal members that showed up. Um, and I'm still getting calls. In fact, last week, I talked to a tribal member who said, Kirby, you know when you guys sent out that letter? I got that letter. I just wasn't up to going. Um, so I'm guessing it's going to continue to happen now. Um, and so what the attorney for the Army Corps of Engineers, after we found out the story of Ophelia, he said, if you tell me, Kirby, that you're related, a descendant of Ophelia, I'm not going to challenge you. And he said, and those pap the paperwork comes to me. <laughs> and he said, so I just want you to know that. And so then I put her down as a descendant of my family with the Paulist name. And that's how I got involved. Once we got involved and we filled out the paperwork, they sent letters stating, you, you filled out the paperwork, we will have um, the disinternment um, in about six months, nine months. Um, they were gonna pay for, I think, two, tribal mem two family members to go, so I asked my assistant, who is also a shirt tail relative of <laughs> mine, um, to, to escort me, and they said, and we will also pay for a spiritual advisor. Two of the other families um, are more traditional, and they go to our traditional ceremony. So they ask somebody in the, um, the longhouse to, to escort them um, on this. And, and I was thinking, this is a spiritual advisor position that's paid for. And I've never done anything like this. I've never heard of anybody who's dug up Deceased. Um, I, I read horror books of stuff like this um, and seen movies. And so I was really scared. I, I didn't want any bad omens. I'm thinking um, we're waking up the soul, the spirit, um, Mother Earth. We're disturbing Mother Earth. And I wasn't sure how to do it safely and right. And as a member, as a Christian and a member of Holy Apostles, I thought, you know, my spiritual advisor is, is the priest at the church. <laughs> and so I, I made a trip up to Father Patient's office and kind of brought you up to yeah. speed where I was at and said, as a spiritual advisor, would you escort me to Pennsylvania, Carlisle, and uh, bring the remains home? And, and that's how you came in. That's how we got connected. I, I had to chuckle, and this is a little history lesson, 
as I understand the history of holy apostles, um, many of the first Oneida who made the trip from New York to Wisconsin in 1822 or so, uh, the first party that made the trip were the Episcopalians. They'd already been Episcopalian for 120 years or so in New York. They had been evangelized by missionaries from England. Uh, so they had been Episcopalian. They'd even sent a delegation over to see Queen Anne in England in the early 1700s. Uh, so uh, Kirby's relatives have been Episcopalian for 300 years. You know. uh, some of the members of the tribe have been practicing the longhouse religion for maybe 40 years, uh, relatively more recently. Um, so, as it ended up, uh, Sonny Hill from the Oneida Cultural Heritage Department, who is a longhouse practitioner, and I uh, were the two spiritual advisors uh, that went with Kirby and Rosa and the Huff family and the Coulon family um, to go and retrieve three children, um, Jemima uh, Matoxen and Sophie Coulon and Ophelia Paulus. Um, the process for me was a really fascinating collision of cultures. <clears throat> it was the collision of the army culture <clears throat> and the native culture, <clears throat> if you will, excuse me. So the army culture is very, very, very rigid, as you might imagine. You know, how do you run a well-oiled military machine? You got to do things exactly the same way every time. So, you know, rigid procedures. Um, the native culture, as I'm discovering as I am in Oneida more and more, less rigid, <laughs> a little bit different. Um, and so it was this fascinating kind of meeting of the two. So the army wants to deal only directly with the families. Um, the army, when they're going to disinter a body, they do it in a certain way. They destroy the headstone so that it can't be reused or get confused uh, because the records have to be uh, correct. And so this process was very, very measured. But what unfolded over the course of about a week was that each of the three families would have a, a day when their relative was being disinterred, was being removed from the grave that they were currently in. On a subsequent day, those remains would be studied by forensic anthropologists from the Army Corps of Engineers. The Corps of Engineers are the ones who do the big construction projects, and every time they dig up human remains, they have to analyze them and understand what's going on. So they have the forensic anthropologists on their team. The forensic anthropologists would then give a report back to the families to really just verify, is this likely to be the person that you're expecting? Right. And so at what had happened to one of the other tribes that went through this process, when they got to that point, the family went all the way to Pennsylvania. They did the disinternment. It was supposed to be a 12-year-old female. The forensic anthropologists, after they studied the bones, it was a 15-year-old male. And so if you can imagine their dismay after going through all this, because if you heard him, they were buried somewhere else. They were reconsumed there and put somewhere else. And so now going forward, before you can even, you go through all this process, that's still not guaranteed that when they dig up the remains that it's who you thought it was. And so there's, as a tribal member, I, I really thought this was gonna be a piece of cake, just get them kids home. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, I don't know them, but yet I know them. And so when we went and they were, they showed us where they disinterred, they dug the grave out, and they had another tent where the remains were put on a black sheet of paper, um, like a velvet, and they had, and only that was remaining was the skeleton remains, and not all of them, just pieces from the head to the toes. And so they tell us what we're gonna see, and I was thinking, I don't wanna see that. And as I'm sitting there thinking, and, and they told us when we're ready, we'll come and get you. So I'm still thinking in my mind, well, I don't need to go 
to all that stuff. And, and sitting there, I thought, you know, these kids, nobody was there for them. And I thought, I'm going to be there with them for their whole journey. And so I went in. And so when I went in, I wasn't expecting emotions to come up. Mm-hmm. And it was quite, um, and it's been uh, really, really um, comforting with having father patients there. You know, and have you heard all the terminology? We were talking about the military and <laughs> everything. That's why we're giving him that part of the story. If we pick up right. from there. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the process began with disinterment and then the viewing of the remains by the forensic anthropologists. The forensic anthropologists then communicating with the families uh, what they found, uh, confirming that this is the relative that you think it is. Um, Also giving some insights into you know, perhaps how they died, for example. You know, one of the children had died of tuberculosis and there was scarring on the ribs, I believe, because of the tuberculosis. So the forensic anthropologists were just the most amazing, uh, gentle teachers, you know, helping us kind of understand what was going on. And then the process concluded with the wrapping of the bodies into a new box that would then go into the coffin in which they would be returned to the families and then transported back here to Wisconsin uh, for reburial. Now, I wanna say a word about the spiritual advisors because as much as the emotions of the families were coming to the fore, I have to say, as a priest, I've done a lot of burials, but I've never done a disinterment. I don't know if Father Guy has ever done a disinterment either. So when Kirby invited me to come with him, I started calling my priest friends and said, does anybody have any prayers for a disinterment? Uh, you know, what, you know, do you just like reverse the words or something? You know, I wasn't exactly sure how that was supposed to work, right? Because that's not something that we usually do. So as Father Patience was going through that at his end, on my end, because we have traditional ways and Christian ways, I was collecting a tobacco pouch. I had some cedar, sage. I had some holy water in a little vial. I had a crucifix on my neck. I wasn't sure what I all needed to make sure that. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) And and, uh, the Oneida cultural advisor, Sonny Hill, and I were probably engaged in a similar process. You know, Sonny was making sure that he brought the sage and the feather for smudging and the tobacco and the other things that he and the two families would need for their traditional ceremonies. Um, I wanted to make sure that I brought our Book of Common Prayer with its funeral prayers and you know, some of those other useful uh, elements that Episcopalians uh, love. We like to have something written down. Uh, that's our comfort zone. <laughs> um, but I, I have to say, in terms of the spirit of the week, the first thing that impressed me was Sonny and his first prayer. Sonny's first prayer was a prayer to the children, apologizing to the children for disturbing their rest and reassuring them that we would take as good care of them as we could and that we would return them to Oneida and put them back in the earth where they belonged just as quickly as we could. That was how he was moved to begin praying for the families that he was helping. And it occurred to me as he was telling me that, that when we do a funeral in the Episcopal Church, we end the service with a commendation and a committal. We commend the one who has died to God's loving care, and we commit them to the earth. And it occurred to me that throughout the entire week that we were in Carlisle, these children were never out of God's loving care. They were out of the earth temporarily, but the grace and the respect that the 
Corps of Engineers and the diggers and the forensic anthropologists showed to the remains of those children, they could not have been better cared for during that brief time that they were out of the earth. Um, Just to add to what he's saying, so through that process, as we were sitting there and they wrapped them, and the wrapping of the remains for me reminded me of the cloth that Christ was wrapped in. It was the same kind of cloth. And they had white gloves on. Their motion was ever so slowly, every piece. And, and when I say the skeletal remains, there were pieces of fingers, of arms, of the legs, maybe a finger. But they would wrap each one and move so slowly when they put it into the casket, or to wrap it in the cloth. And it was done so respectfully and solemn. And, um, and, and like he said, the respect they had, it was just incredible. That's right, that's right. We were invited at that wrapping ceremony on the last day uh, if we wanted to offer prayers during that time. I believe that Sonny offered prayers with his two families that were more to do with protection. That is to say, you know, protect us from being in the presence of the deceased. Um, my prayers were guided more by what I saw the forensic anthropologists doing, uh, by the grace that they displayed, uh, the gentleness and respect that they, they displayed. And I was moved to pray for them and ask to anoint their hands with oil because their hands were instruments of healing for Kirby and Rosa, for the other two families. Um, such a uh, respectful and beautiful uh, process. The military culture then reasserted itself, if you will, because the last part of the formal process was the formal handover of custody of these children from the army to the families. And if any of you have ever witnessed a military funeral, you have seen what that formal ceremony looks like. The head of the Army National Military Cemeteries, Karen Durham Aguilera, the civilian equivalent of a three-star general, was present off and on throughout the whole week, but was present in her official capacity to transfer the custody of these children uh, through her sergeant major, who folded the American flag and presented it from the coffin to her for her to present to the family members. Uh, she presented each family member and those of us who were present with the coin of a military leader, in this case the coin from Arlington National Cemetery, as part of that ceremonial transfer. Uh, but everything done just so, in the most proper fashion with all of the dignity that you would expect from a military funeral. And then the children were placed in and, the waiting And at waiting the same purses. time that ceremony was mm -hmm. going on, the presenting of the military flag, the United States flag, again, you would think, I was thinking there's no emotions to this whole process. <laughs> and. I, I was reminded, and I, I, I can't explain enough how the roller coaster of emotions mm -hmm. through this whole process was. And, and I'm telling myself, I don't know this person. And these emotions would come up, and I, I was trying to get a grip where that was coming from. And um, I, I still deal with that today. But okay. Absolutely, absolutely. When the children were... Uh, finally returned to the families. Uh, they were placed in waiting hearses and immediately transported all the way to Wisconsin. Uh, they, no stopping, direct motion from one place to the next. They arrived in Wisconsin at one o'clock on the Sunday morning 
uh, to the funeral home that does most of the funerals for the Oneida Nation. Uh, a week after we got home was the Oneida Nation powwow, uh, which is usually held right around July 4th weekend. And uh, we normally, on the Sunday morning, have an ecumenical worship service on the powwow grounds. And so most of us are not in our regular churches Sunday morning. We're early in the morning up at the powwow grounds. And so we decided, uh, at Kirby's suggestion, uh, to have the funeral for the three children at Holy Apostles, which is the central and public church on the reservation. Uh, two of the children were not going to be buried in Holy Apostles Cemetery, but in the Oneida Nation's own uh, sacred burial grounds. But there's no reason why we wouldn't hold a funeral at the Episcopal Church at Holy Apostles. Um, but we decided to do that a little bit later on that Sunday morning, uh, the Sunday of the powwow weekend, and uh, invited everybody from the community to come right. uh, for that funeral service. Yet before that, on the Friday night before the mm -hmm. services, mm -hmm. um, I had worked with the Oneida Powwow Committee in our community, and I asked for an honor song for those three children. And what they did is, after the powwow started, we invited all the relatives of those children out to the middle of the powwow grounds, and we lined them up. And when they do an honor song, the family goes one time around the whole circle. And everybody who traveled with us, and you go one complete circle, walking as the drum is playing, after one complete circle, then the community comes down and give their condolences, and they line up behind you. And so it was, again, another welcoming back to our community. So it was, um, that was very, I think, comforting uh, as a community member. Absolutely. One of the priests that I talked to uh, before I went to Carlisle <clears throat> had made the connection for me with a passage of scripture uh, from the story of the people of Israel when they were slaves in Egypt and they had uh, negotiated with Pharaoh uh, through plagues and everything else uh, to secure their release, uh, their exodus from Egypt. Um, but the people of Egypt, when, or the people of Israel, when they left Egypt, they brought back with them the bones of Joseph because they had promised to bring his bones back to the promised land with them. And it was that scripture passage that I read at the military transfer uh, of the remains of the children in Carlisle. And then we read that again at the funeral um, sounding that note of exile and return. You know, the Oneida people know what exile is about because they were exiled from their own homeland, from New York to Wisconsin, so many years ago. The children who went to the boarding schools know what exile is about because they were exiled from their families. Uh, even if they returned home, many of them still talk about the trauma of that experience of exile. And certainly these children who had died so far from home um, had been exiled even in death. And part of our work was to bring them home to return their bones to be with their families, uh, to be again surrounded uh, by their nation, by their relatives. Um, so that theme, which never would have occurred to me before, <laughs> uh, a, a priest friend of mine suggested, um, and it turned into something that I have held on to ever since. Um, throughout this process, too, is um, in our community, we have Oneidas throughout the state of Wisconsin. As you know, we have uh, Oneida over this way <laughs> on Melcher. But in our community, there was, um, you know, Wisconsin's like your hand. Up in Door County, we had a, a, a family of tribal members, Matoxins, that lived up in Sturgeon Bay. And my parents knew about them, my grandfather knew about them, and <clears throat> we called them the North Side Matoxins. We were the <laughs> South Side Matoxins. And um, I just knew that, I, I, growing up, I'm thinking, why did they go to Sturgeon Bay? But this unique um, experience that one of the families were those Matoxins. And they had 12 kids, and the last one was a boy, 
um, their children were take, so the older children were taken to the boarding school and the do, one of the daughters that went never came home. And because they were going to reservations and taking the children by, by force again, family members were in panic when you had families, when you had children. That particular family moved to Sturgeon Bay and if anybody's been up to Sturgeon Bay, it's, I'm cherry picking um, up there. And so the family moved into a middle, middle of a cherry orchard in a little wooden shack. And the father left Oneida because he didn't want them to take his children. That family stayed up in Sturgeon Bay. They're still there. The descendants of that family are still in Sturgeon Bay. I didn't know how they got there, mm -hmm. but to find out this kind of related to them being up there. And they hid out in the cherry orchards. They worked the apple orchards up there. Their, um, the father ended up being uh, working on the shipyard and he kept them away from Oneida. And that's probably about an hour, hour and a half distance. Um, but that's how they ended up being there and finding out their story on this journey. That's right. And I think in a way the conclusion of the story uh, at least of this particular chapter of it. Uh, we reflected with the tribal liaison from the Army Corps of Engineers about the experience of different tribes uh, in this process of, of uh, seeking to have resolution about what to do about children. <clears throat> Some tribes, uh, he was telling us, um, choose to leave the children where they are that because of the way they believe, they would rather not disturb a child who has died and been buried. Other tribes, like the Oneida, uh, some family members will choose to have the children disinterred and, and brought home. Um, so it's a complicated negotiation. Um, he remembered well that experience with the northern Arapaho, where family members came expecting to bring a child home, but were not able to because it was the wrong child, because there had been a clerical error in marking where the new grave for a particular child was. And so I think it was a hopeful conclusion, in a way, to this season's work, in that all three of the Oneida families who made the trip brought a child home, that the process was so full of grace and of respect and of generosity. Everyone, I think, who worked with us could not have been kinder or more respectful. Um, so I think there's a sense of hope that as news media came and covered the funeral and reported on this uh, experience, uh, that they were reporting on a good experience and that perhaps it would be encouraging to other tribal families uh, whom the Army might speak to in the future, um, you know, that this is a process that is potentially a good one, uh, a healing one. So I think the final mm -hmm. part journey for me has been that the um, going through this experience and all the wrongs that have been done to Native people, this was an opportunity for the Army Corps of Engineers to right a wrong mm -hmm. and pain and bringing those children back to the reservation. Absolutely, absolutely. I think that's just about the end of anything that we supposedly prepared. So at this point, we might invite any questions that you all have, if there's something that we could explain further. For either one of you or both of you, uh, if I understood correctly, there are still four children that you think are an item still in that. Yes. Yeah. We still have four children out there, and I have two families that have reached out to me and, and said that they've seen the deadlines last year, they just couldn't get themselves to move on it. So one came, uh, one filled out the application a month after the deadline, because the Army Corps of Engineers, they give you deadlines. <laughs> Once they give you a deadline, that's the deadline. And actually, even when you get out there, when they say they're gonna pick you up at nine o'clock, it's not a minute after nine, it's nine o'clock and they're, they're <laughs> heading out. So, so those, those four children will remain 
for the foreseeable future there? I think two of those will be coming home within the next two years. And then I, I'm not sure about the other two yet. Mm -hmm. So the, the two the two families who still are willing to call met the deadline, in other words. They have filled the paperwork out, but the Army has 562 tribes to work with. And so we're not the only ones. <laughs> so, so the paperwork's been filled out, and when it might result in another trip, we don't know. And it's usually know. the same. What month was it? This was like June, May, June, something like that. So they try to do the disinternment the same time of year, and it has to do with the rain, the weather, because they need everything to be working together. And it's about a three-week window when you start, and then probably a month out, then they say, okay, we're picking this day, you fly out, and this day you come home. So the deadline was uh, never again the situation? No, no, it's just for this year's season, so to speak. And part of that is because the forensic anthropologists <coughs> clear their calendars for this work. Uh, many of them reported to us that it doesn't matter whatever else is going on in my <coughs> professional life. I clear my calendar for this work at Carlisle. Um, in part, one of them said, because I never actually get to talk to a family like this. You know, usually I've dug someone up who's 10,000 years old. <laughs> uh, you know, here I actually get to speak to human beings about what I'm discovering. And, and you know, they, they treasure that moment as well. So. I also want to say I want to thank you guys. Thank mm -hmm. every for inviting us out here. There was two things that happened to me out in, in Carlisle. Um, Father Patience set up a meeting with the, um, the, the priest from the base, yeah. and we got a chance to meet with him, and he was retiring. And in our conversation with him, he had been by that cemetery all these years, looked at it as a military cemetery, and it, it kind of caught him off guard that these were children. That was one experience that I had out there that this story has to be told. The other one was the hotel we stayed at was about 10 miles away. And, um, one, and, and we were there for five, six days. Um, one of the days I, w I was in the lobby, there was two gentlemen, and I was just talking to them. And they said, where are you from? I said, Wisconsin, I'm here for, and I asked them, do you know where the mili Carlisle um, military base? He said, yeah, I grew up here my whole life. And both of them worked at the hotel we were at. And the one gentleman said, yeah, I grew up right in that neighborhood. I rode my bike by there every day as a kid going to school. And I was telling him why we were there, that those headstones, and he said, yeah, all them white headstones. I said, those are children. And he never knew that. He never knew there was a boy. He was born and raised there, adult, and knew nothing about it. So again, I want to thank you for the invite to come out here and share the story. Absolutely. Thank you. Other questions? The boy that was, that they turned, I thought was a girl, turned out to be a boy. What happened? <laughs> so, um, what one of the forensic anthropologists told us they discovered was in their cut and dried way, they would have expected the records to be telling them the right story because it looked like everything was panning out. Um, they could tell, for example, that all of the children were disinterred and reinterred really at the same time. It was a single project and probably there was one carpenter who made all the boxes because the nails were in the same pattern on every single box. You know, you know, somebody had said, make 180 boxes, so he made 180 boxes. And they had maps, you know, clear map of cemetery number one, clear map of cemetery number two, and the numbers looked like they should have just transferred one for one for one. Turns out that in that same file, there was a scrap of a corner of paper that said something like, C1 is really in B2. Well, you don't look at the scrap first, you look at the map first. But it turns out that the scrap was telling the truth, you know, uh, that the scrap of paper actually told where the proper children could be found. I don't know if 
they're able to circle back with that same family to come and get the child who's in the different grave. I don't know that. Um, but they were telling us the story about the additional detective work that they had to do to try and piece together uh, what had actually happened. Yeah. But in the end, that child stayed there and the family went home. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so they may come back for a, a second chance, but we don't know. We don't know that for sure. But that story, I have to tell you, uh, scares me to death because we run a cemetery <laughs> at Church of the Holy Apostles. Uh, that's hard. It's complicated. And now I'm a little bit uh, worried that we've got scraps of paper in the bottom of our files somewhere because <laughs> I know that some of the maps don't actually match some of the other maps. And the um, scarier part is my <laughs> uncle was in charge of the cemetery. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. We, we know who the problem is and it's us. <laughs> it's us. Because, yes, managing a cemetery is kind of complicated. Yeah. Good question. Are you going to write a book about this? It sounds like something that we should share with so many people. Well, I'm not going to write a book about it, I don't think. Um, partly because we have a noted Oneida historian already in our congregation. So I'm going to do a little shameless plug here. Gordy McClester is a longtime member of Church of the Holy Apostles. He's a longtime Oneida historian. He has co-written 15 books of history on the Oneida Nation. In fact, when I came to Holy Apostles three years ago, I was presented with a reading list. <laughs> Here you go. Um, and his most recent book, I'm sorry? <laughs> exactly. Um, his most recent book just came out this summer, and it's a <clears throat> book called The Wisconsin Oneidas and the Episcopal Church. Uh, the subtitle is A Chain Linking Two Traditions. Uh, Gordy tells the story of a sort of metaphor, if you will, of a chain between the Oneida and the Episcopal Church that sometimes needs to be polished if the relationship's not been terribly good. So sometimes we need to get back together, polish the chain and, and treat each other well. Sometimes it's been good for a long time, but the chain is getting stretched or broken in places and we need to repair it. Um, so his most recent history is about the relationship between the Episcopal Church and the Oneida people. Um, I'm surrounded by historians and so I want to let them do their work first. The, but like the, Oneida, Kirby, the Oneida Business Committee also meets every other week mm -hmm. on a Wednesday. And so this coming Wednesday we will be <clears throat> honoring Gordy McGlester at, at one of our um, meetings and his family's coming up so it will yeah. be this Wednesday about nine o'clock and we'll be presenting him with honors and for all his work that he's mm -hmm. done and he's, he's in his um, probably close to 80s he has um, diabetes he's um, with a walker I think he's um, le legally blind now yeah. um, so we're, we're hoping he makes it there mm -hmm. And the next day on Thursday, he'll be doing a book signing and a discussion of his new book at the parish hall right across the street from Holy Apostles. Um, so long answer to a short question, but like Kirby, I'm committed to making sure that the story gets out there. Um, I was impressed by the, again, by the work of the Army Corps of Engineers and the folks from the National Military Cemeteries, the forensic anthropologists. I think they treated Kirby and Rosa and the other two families with all of the gentleness and kindness at their disposal. Um, I think that's a story that's worth telling um, to encourage others to engage in this process. The other thing that I'm impressed mm -hmm. with is when we buried the remains in Oneida and the service was over, I thought that was the end. And it, things like this kind of pop back up and that's it right. keeps moving things forward. Right. So again, thanks, Evie, and mm -hmm. letting us share this story with you. Indeed. Other questions? Yes. My sister lives up near Hague, which is a different, a totally different tribe. But when um, when someone dies, when they prepare them for uh, burial, the family, um, the mother, the grandmother prepares the body. Um, I think in native dress, but they prepare the body for burial. Was anything like this done before these children were reburied for 
were, was the wrapping that the, the anthropologists did the only thing? Nothing with the dress, as far as I'm wrapping them up, that was kind of consistent on what the military did. I think what the families did, um, the traditional people, um, the women all wore skirts. So anytime they were near any, the cemetery or the funeral, they had to wear skirts. And, and women are supposed to be in a skirt and they, they did a lot of smudging with the eagle feather and sage and cedar. Mm -hmm. It's essentially, it's washing the smoke from sage over your body. You use a feather essentially to guide the smoke over your body. It's um, kind of like the incense when they bow at you <laughs> and the incense. Mm -hmm. Same yeah. comp, taking our if prayers If you swing it at yourself a little bit, uh, same thing. <laughs> or just stand near it and, and appreciate it, yeah. One of the questions, interesting question that the anthropologists asked us about was, whether we wished for any of the hardware from the original coffin or any of the pieces of wood from the second box that the remains were in, if we wished any of that to be in with the remains in the new casket. Um, I would imagine that some tribes are thinking along the lines of anything that has touched the deceased needs to stay with them. Um, I think the decision that all of us made was that it really it was only the body of the children, the remains of the children proper that we wanted to bring back home. So handles from an old casket, that's not a necessary part of what we chose to include. So, yeah. I think you had a question, Evie. I was reading some um, documentation of the boarding school from Wittenberg, and there's a professor at the university in River Falls who's done research on the Wittenberg school. And I was just curious, there were Oneida names on some of those rosters that I saw, or, or listing as Oneida tribe and names that were common names. Do you know if there are cemeteries on these other, these other schools that you mentioned, Wittenberg and wherever else they might be in Wisconsin? Since this project, um, there have been tribal members that have come forward. And there was a boarding school in, in Haskell, Kansas. Yeah. And um, one of our council members is on the Border Regis and he's been on there. He went, graduated there, went to school there, and he, he goes to meetings out there, and he's come back and said, there's a cemetery at Haskell, and we have tribal members at Haskell Cemetery. So it's, I think it's triggering more people to come forward. Right. I, I've heard a story of a boarding school in Toma, Wisconsin, um, but the story that I heard was that there was a mass grave there. And so really less or no chance of determining who, what children are actually buried there. Um, I don't know any more details than that, but as Kirby says, you know, the stories may, may start to come out as people see this uh, positive uh, response and then go and ask other schools you know, what's going on. Yeah. I'm sorry, two people are asking questions at once. Let me, let me get you first. Maybe uh, the forensic anthropologists in this case did not use DNA testing uh, of any kind. I would imagine that it's extremely expensive and time-consuming. So they were more concerned, having done careful identification of you know the body and the name is 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 matched. Does this appear to be the body of someone? You know similar age and size, but it could be, it could be. Mm -hmm. That's right. Sir, you had a, a question too. I was saying if, if there is in fact a mass grave in Toma area, has, has that been identified? I've only heard it as a story, so I, I was only responding to that particular question. Treated as sacred ground, if that's possible anymore. Right. There was a, a channel too, which is the public channel here on this side of the state. 
Certainly in Canada, there's also a great deal of attention being paid today uh, to the legacy of residential schools. And in fact, just last weekend, the Anglican Church of Canada um, had a service at which they publicly announced the names of more than 2,000 children known to have died in residential schools. Um, uh, there was also just a news item today from the Canadian government, uh, you know, essentially not wanting to address <laughs> the legacy of residential schools. It's a, it's a very fraught and complicated subject, absolutely. Oh, Canada had them in, in greater numbers probably than the U.S. did. Um, and, and by all accounts, more uh, horrific. Absolutely. I'm quite familiar with the Canadian situation. I'm from Canada originally. Right. Yeah. Uh, it, it, one of the things that I've learned about that era, that era in American history, is that in some ways the U.S. government was looking to be free of the burden of caring for Indian nations with whom they had treaties. And so in a sense, they let out the franchise for taking care of the Indians to churches, like our own Episcopal Church, or the Methodist Church, or the Presbyterians. And so the churches were the ones running the schools on behalf of the government um, you know, in order to discharge the government's obligations or not. Um, you know, but but there's, there are so many layers to the story. Uh, Carlisle happens to be a military and school kind of story, but many others were church schools, um, you know, which introduces a whole other layer of, of agony. So, yeah. I can't think of anything else to say at the moment unless anyone has any final questions, but... We really, again, appreciate the chance to come and visit with you all tonight. Thank you for coming out. Thank you, sir. Good job. Now bring your friends and your folks along Down to the river and sing this song